All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, you know what I'm saying? A peaceful day of atonement. Have a little special uh, study for us to kind of go through marriage um, and talk to a few things, talk through a few things. Um, so peace, Sorry. Sister Pamela. Let us know if we sound all right. Make sure everything sound all right. <clears throat> yeah, but on the Day of Atonement, we, we kind of covered it on last Sabbath. Oh, yeah. Appreciate you, boy. Um, we covered, you know, Day of Atonement on the last Sabbath study. So now that we've actually reached the actual Day of Atonement, um, as we recognize it, uh, now we want to have another study. Um, no, know that when you go to, you can go to the website, you can check out the, the, the days and the way that we recognize the days. Um, and there'll be a chart on the right hand side of that chart. It'll tell you the sacred assembly. It have a column that says sacred assembly and it'll say yes or no. If it says sacred assembly, just know that that record, that, that means that, uh, these are days that the most high God said there's no work, right? So you know, when you're dealing with your jobs or you're planning out your year or whatever, when you look at that, if you want to align with how we recognize the days, then um, you can you can use that to understand when you when you need to take off work or just give it right to your boss or submit all your request times, your vacation, PTO, however you decide to do it. You can also align with the calendar. If you have Google Calendar, or your Apple Calendar or whatever, um, just click on the uh, on the link that says download to your device. And it'll put it right on your calendar for you. Um, any questions, as always, just reach out to us. Uh, but um, hopefully all the brothers and sisters that's aligned with us on, on this Day of Atonement, or on, on whenever they celebrate it, that they have a, a peaceful fast. That the Most High God uh, blesses them. Uh, but let's kind of get into to marriage and the institution of marriage and try to understand a little bit of it. So to do that, we have to start at the very beginning. Um, let's go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> Not the swine pink. <laughs> I got the swine. Oh man. <laughs> it's salmon. That's clean, by the way. <laughs> this is obviously salmon. Y'all almost got me. Almost. Almost. Look how easy it is. Fire. Almost. It was that close. Almost. Ooh. Son, you didn't even protect me when I asked for water. You just had it for me. Yeah. All right. Verse one, you said? I appreciate it, yeah. Um, yeah, let's do uh, Genesis, not verse one. Do uh, verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And mm -hmm. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and cloaked and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall well, he said, this is now me. bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Right. He looking out. He naming all the animals. He looking like, yeah, now that's a cow there. You know what I'm saying? Oh, now I don't know. That one right there, I'm gonna call it uh, I'm gonna call it a porcupine. You know what I'm saying? Like this one right here. Oh, whoa, alligator. Definitely alligator. You know what I'm saying? So he's naming these things, and of course he's not naming them th these English names, but you know what I'm saying? He's naming all these animals and he's giving them names. And the most high God created the animals male and female when he created them, right? So he's giving them names. Then he looking, he like, you know what I'm saying? I kind of like this little puppy. You know what I'm saying? I kind of like this. But it's just like none of this stuff fit me. Like I ain't got no companionship like they got. Right? So the most high God said, okay, that's all right. He caused a deep sleep to go on him. Pulled a rib up out the man. You know what I'm saying? And he made a woman for him, from him. And then when he looked at the woman, he is like, she came from me. He said, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Right? It felt special to him. That's why he's saying that it felt special. Because he's like, she came from me. Right? Let's see. Watch this. One second, one second, bro. <laughs> so, 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 Pamela said that pinky finger. I do drink with the pinky up, boy. Ooh, I was ready. I was ready. 
Almost got me. Uh, where are we at? Oh, in the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Mm -hmm. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Mm -hmm. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Right. So he said a man is going to leave his father and his mother. And then what he's going to end up doing is he's going to cleave. In other words, he's going to attach himself to his wife. But the next part says, then they shall be one flesh. So they're going to be just like one. Right. They're going to just be, be just like one. Those two. Right. When y'all should talk about it, the two shall become one flesh. That's that. So we can talk about, you know what I'm saying? The, um, a husband having multiple wives and, and all that. We'll, we'll get to that. Right. But in the beginning, you look at it, it says the two shall be, ha shall have one flesh, right? The two shall be one flesh. And so that was an honor. That's what he looked at. This was something that, that, that Adam appreciated. And this is, this is the first marriage, right? This is the, the first time that the most high God kind of displayed marriage in the, in the form of man. So you have those two. And if you look at it from the very beginning, if you look at, uh, let's go to, uh, chapter one, back to chapter one, I want to say it's verse 27. Might be 25. Start me at 25, just in case. And God it's Genesis made, chapter one, verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them. Right. So he created him in the image of Yah, male and female created he them. Right. So the male and female are the image of the most high God. Right. When he says man, he's talking about Adam. He's talking about all the people. Right. He created mankind in the image of Yah. Right. Then after that, he says male and female, he created them. So he split mankind into male and female. You don't get to the image of Yah without both. Right. Grab, um, grab, uh, grab, uh, Proverbs chapter eight, verse. I don't know if it's verse one. It might be down maybe verse 20 or something like that. But see, see what verse one say first. Let's see. It's Proverbs chapter eight, verse one. We got a lot to cover. It's a lot. There's a lot of wisdom that comes along with, with, with marriage, right? Not just wisdom from, from understanding, you know, how marriage works and what the most high God has to say about marriage. But it takes a lot of wisdom to to um, to properly, you know, to participate in a marriage, you know. And so we uh, we want to, you know, make sure that we take our time with it. And it's a whole lot of uh, it's a whole lot of information that we can deliver as we talk about this topic. This is uh, Proverbs chapter eight. Let's see what verse one says. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? Look, how, how is wisdom considered? He said, male and female created he them. And then he refers to wisdom as what? As a her. He said her voice. This is intentional. Watch this. She standeth in the top on high places, by the way, in places of the paths. She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city and at coming in of the doors. Mm hmm. Unto you, O man, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Here, mm -hmm. for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, The wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They right, so this is, this is the same wisdom that the most high God is using to testify of Yahushua. 
right? This same wisdom the Most High God is using to testify of Yahushua, but he yet calls it a her. When we talk about nations, right? When he talks about Israel, he categorizes Israel as a nation as the female, right? So these are things, even us, right? We are his bride as a nation, right? So it's, it's important that we understand marriage, not just, from, not just from a practical sense, although it's very important that we understand marriage from, from, a, for, from a practical sense, but that practical sense now informs the prophetic sense, right? When we look at, at, at the prophecy around marriage and how the Most High God spoke to us through the prophets, if we don't really understand marriage, then it becomes difficult to understand the similitudes that he presents in front of us through the prophets and through the Proverbs, right? So it's a reason why a woman is chosen as whip, uh, or a female is chosen as to represent the, the wisdom and to represent the nation, right? Because the Most High God has covenants and agreements and relationships with these concepts, right? And the Most High God is always going to represent the man, right? The male. So let's look at it. This is, um, this is, uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter 18. And Proverbs 8 is a good read. If you guys, you know, I, I recommend you guys read Proverbs 8 on your own time. It's Proverbs chapter 8. Let's do, I mean, 18. Let's do verse 22. <clears throat> Whoso findeth the wife findeth the good thing and obtains favor of Yahuwah. Right. So this is spoken to this. The, the, the audience here would be a man. Right. So a man who finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Right. And and he going to have favor to, to Yahuwah. There's benefits to marriage. Right. It's, it's things. It's, there's a, this is something that the Most High God set up from the very beginning. And this is something that is to be desired by a man and by a woman. Right. It is something to be desired. But before we go deep into, you know, how much marriage is to be desired, we need to be able to look at things on the opposite side as well, because perhaps marriage is something that is not for everyone. Right. We don't have to get it. But Yahushua said uh, he spoke to us about a unit. Right. And he, he gave us a couple situations, some of which those situations were a man can make himself a unit. Right. In other words, a man, a eunuch being someone who who, um, you know, like the most literal sense of a eunuch is is someone who either was born or uh, someone, you know, mutilated them to where they don't have their genitals. Right. So you could you could be born deformed and your genitals don't work properly or you don't have genitals. Right. Or. Someone can, you know, what I'm saying attack you or, you know, what I'm saying mutilate you in the, in the sense that you don't have your gener genitals. But Yahushua also brought up another situation that a person makes himself a unit. Right. Meaning that this person constrains himself that he doesn't have those that, that type of romantic interaction. Right. That try, But let's say that sexual uh, romantic interaction. Right. So a man can make himself the unit to say, no, I don't want to be married. Right. I just want to remain to myself. And that's a part that I don't think is talked about a lot. And uh, Paul also explained he expounded more on that about how the one that, you know, stays to himself does better. Matter of fact, let's get it. That's uh, first Corinthians chapter seven. Give me about verse twenty five. Let's see what Paul has to say on the topic. It's first Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty five. This is the side of things that I don't think is spoken about much. I think marriage is always kind of held up as this is the goal. This should be the goal for everybody. You're the guys who promote multiple wives. It's all about nation building, nation building, nation build, building. We'll get to all that. Right. And and I think the idea behind it is, hey, grow, be fruitful. How can you do that um, lawfully or, or righteously unless you are married? Right. 
But let's look at the other side. Let's look at the wisdom that Paul has given us as well. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25. <clears throat> now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that has... Look, so pay attention throughout... We're going to read a lot in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and you'll see that the Most High God is leading Paul to, to present things one of two ways, right? Hey, this is what God is saying, not me, or this is what I am saying, not God, right? He makes that distinction. He's saying the, the things that I'm saying, this is my advice. This is based off of, off of my life experiences and my wisdom from the book. And he's going to tell you at the very end, and he's going to be like, and I think I have the spirit of God kind of being, you know what I'm saying? A little facetious, like, you know what I'm saying? And I think I have the spirit of God. When I tell you these things. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not just, I'm not just running my mouth now. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm the man. I got you. Don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? So he's like, I think I have the spirit of God, but he still makes that separation. This is documented. I can prove this to you from the book. This is just based off of what I understand from the book. This is my advice to you based off of my experience, what I think will work better in the times that we live in all that, right? That's his opinion, right? So pay attention to that as we talk. I'll try to call it up as we read it too. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Mm -hmm. I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Thou Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. All right, so he said, if you're married, right, bound to a wife, don't seek to be loosed. In other words, don't seek to be apart. This is his advice. He's saying, this is what I'm telling you from my judgment. If you are married, don't seek to be unmarried. Right? Watch this. Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Right? If you are loose from a wife, in other words, if you're not married for whatever reason, right? And you're not married, don't go looking for a wife. This is his advice, right? This is his advice based, based off of his, his experiences, what he know of the book, and his judgment, right? Go ahead. Keep going. <clears throat> But, but, and if you marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Never. Right. So he's, he's making it clear that if he, this is my advice, but if you end up doing, if you end up going against my advice, that's not a sin. He's telling you flat out what you, what I'm, I'm advising you with this. If you not marry, don't go trying to get married. That's my advice. But if you do go get married, that's not a sin. Right. Keep going. <clears throat> Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Right? He says, such shall have trouble in the, in the flesh, but I spare you. So in other words, he said, listen, if you do it, you're going to have other challenges in the flesh that I'm trying to spare you from. This is why I'm, this is why I'm giving you this judgment. This is why I'm giving you my advice. Right? If you ask me how I would do it, this is how I would do it. If you do it the other way, you're not sinning. But I think you're going to have some problems with the flesh. So, right? So before I got married, I spent a year where I, when I learned what the scriptures were saying, I wasn't married. And I went a whole year with the understanding of, a, of the scriptures not being married. Then when I got married, this made so much more sense because when I was by myself in the scriptures, all of those fleshly challenges I didn't have. A whole new level of fleshly challenges came after I got married. So I know, like I, I, I thought about this verse a lot after I got married. Like, man, I didn't have these temptations and struggles, you know, when I was just single, just reading the word. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that was tough too. That was tough too. So. Um, but it's just certain things that you can deal with. Just know what you can and can't deal with. And to me, it was much easier when I was seeing. But I'm not just, I'm not seeking to be loosed either. So I just understand, you know, from experience what, what he means by that. All right. Let's keep going. He'll explain more. But this I say, my brethren, 
The time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they weep not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. Right. So he's saying the time is short. In other words, the world's about to end is what Paul's trying to tell you. Right. He's like, man, the world about to end. It's going to be even if you got a wife, it's like going to be like you don't have one. Because it's just like the commitment that it's going to take. It, everything that you bought it's going to be as if you don't have any possessions. Right. He said it's going to take that level of commitment in the last days. Right. So he's telling you that the time is short because in his mind, he's looking like. This thing can happen any day. The time is short. You got to prepare yourself to make it into this kingdom. Right? Keep going. Watch this. And they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passes away. But mm -hmm. I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord and how he may please the Lord. Pay attention. This is what Brother T was just talking about, right? So he says, I will have you without carefulness. When, when the book talks about carefulness, it's talking about worrying, right? So he's saying, I will have you without worrying. He, right? Let's read it again. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belongs to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Right? So he's saying the righteous man that is unmarried, right? Just like Brother T was talking about, can focus on Yah. Right. My only worry is like I don't have additional responsibilities. Right. If 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 right this moment, if I was single. Right. And a prophet came to me and said, get up, go to Washington, D.C. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and tell you know what I'm saying and tell Senator so and so thus says Yahuwah. Right. If he just popped up to me right now in a vision or a dream and I was unmarried and told me, pick up and go. Spend six months on your side. You know what I'm saying? Lay on your back on Capitol Hill for six months. You know what I'm saying? Proclaiming X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? Like me, I'd just be like, I got that. You know what I'm saying? How much a ticket cost? Let's do it. Right? It wouldn't be no thought. I wouldn't have to worry about anything else because I'm only responsible for myself. Right? I don't have any other worries. I just have to go. I pick up and like, you know what? Sold my house. Do this, that, and the other. Got a little money. I can go. Now, if, if that same vision come to me right now, it's a lot more to consider. That exact same vision, I got, okay, well, hold on. Well, hold on. Well, baby, hold on. I'm going to go, but like, I'm going to be, no, I'm going to be back. No, the most I got told me I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. That's an argument now. What do you mean you got to go? You going to quit your job? Who going to quit your job? Okay. Cool. I know, baby, but I got to do it. Got it. Okay. My baby going to be with me. She's going to be like, okay, well, I'm going to hold it down. You're going to get it. But now, when I'm there, what am I thinking about when I'm laying on my back? Man, I wonder what my kids is doing. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? When I'm taking my call, I take a call. Oh, yeah, no, you should have saw Zakai today. He was in T-ball. He hit the ball. What that's going to do to me? Man, I wish I could have been there. See, my boy hit the ball. Right? There's attachments that comes with the family. And so now, although that's a beautiful thing and it's a blessing from the Most High God, when it comes down to choosing between Yah and choosing between the family, that is a temptation. That is a difficult situation, right? And Paul recognizes that and he's saying, listen, although you don't sin by having a family and by getting married and do all these things, he says, it's not a sin, right? My judgment is because of the distress of this time, right? He's saying because of, of what I know, how this thing is about to play out, in my opinion, you'd be better off staying single because in that you can put all of your focus towards Yahuwah, right? This is something that's not talked about enough, right? It's something that we should all consider and Paul is saying it for a reason. It makes sense, right? Hold what we got right there. Grab, uh, grab um, Matthew chapter 19. This is Matthew chapter 19 down, down towards the bottom like... Uh, Verse, uh, in fact, it'll be exactly verse 28. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. We'll, we'll go, we'll come back to Matthew chapter 19 later, but let's get verse 28 right now. Because I want you to see that what Paul is telling you as his advice 
is he's not pulling it out of thin air, right? He's not pulling it out of thin air. You have to understand what Yahushua said as well. This is Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And Yahushua said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging mm -hmm. the twelve tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. and everyone that has forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many so Yahushua is rewarding folks, right? He's saying, I'm going to give you a hundred times what you left. If you left your wife, your child, your mom, your dad, your family, your land, your how all these different things for me, I'm going to give you a hundredfold. So Yahushua recognizes that this is difficult because he's telling you, if you do it, I'm going to reward you a hundred times for that. Right. Had it had, if it weren't a big deal, Yahushua wouldn't have said that. He wouldn't have tried to incentivize you to do it. But he had to because he knows. That that's a difficult choice to leave your family behind. Grab a uh, Luke 14. I don't know where this one is. This one is probably maybe 27. Luke 14, maybe 27. It may be further up than that. Actually, it may be like nine. What's the last verse in Luke 14? Is it 50 something? It is. Or is it 30 something? Pages right now. It is what's this, 35. 35. So, yeah, it's probably going to be like Luke 14, maybe verse 14 or 15. You know what I'm looking for, right? You want, if any, should man, come. If any man come to me and hate not, yeah. 25, yeah, yeah, yeah. 25. Oh, what verse is it? 25. 25? Oh, okay. It's Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Watch the book say. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Right? So he's telling you, first of all, you see, he, he never gives you any conditions on being his Christian. You know what I'm saying? On being his Hebrew Israelite. That don't mean nothing. All this stuff we call ourselves, that stuff don't mean nothing. Call yourself what the book call you, a disciple, right? We are disciples. We're not Christians. We're not Hebrew Israelites. We're not Baptists. We're not Catholics. All this wild stuff these people have taught us. We're disciples. That's what the man called us. Call us what the book call us, period, right? But he said the condition on being his disciple is you got to be willing. He say hate, right? But what he's saying is you have to be willing to leave, right? To be seen as someone who hates your family. You have to be willing for that because that's why people that's how people going to describe us. Right. If I up right now, left my family, people going to be like, man, that boy is a deadbeat. He don't love his family. It's that he hate his family. Right. If I if I told my mama, no, I disagree, we disagree with you about the book. This is how I'm going to live my life. This that, another. He's going to be like, man, hey, he was disrespectful to his mama. His mama said this that, another. That's how people going to look at you. Y'all sure already know that. So he's telling them any man who ain't willing to hate in that sense, right? Not truly hate because, you know what I'm saying, we're not called to hate nobody, right? But any man who, who, who does not hate his mother, his father, his children, the books say, right? He said, you're not worthy to be his disciple. You can't be called his disciple. So now that becomes a challenge. This is a long list of things. That, read it again, the list that he gave us. Any man come to me and hate, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So now when you look at this from Paul, Paul's advice, if a person, now you can't choose to be born without brothers and sisters, right? But if a person was an only child, guess what? This list becomes a little bit easier. I don't have to worry about a brother and sister now, Right? If I've already lost my parents, God forbid, right? And I'm an only child. Now, this list becomes a little bit easier because I don't have to worry about turning away from my mom, my dad, or, and I don't have a brother and sister, right? I can't necessarily control those, though. But the next two you can control. You can control the wife and you can control the children, right? You can control 
whether you have a wife and whether you have children. That's all within your realm, all within your decision. Right. And so that's why Paul says, listen, of this list of things that the most high God is requiring you to turn away from. Right. He requires it if it comes down to it. And there's a choice between your family and me talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If that's the choice, he requires you to turn away from these things. So he's like, man, in this list, if you remain single, you shaving stuff off of the list. So Sister Pamela was asking, what does hate here mean? And it's basically like saying um, like to 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 de to denounce. Right. So. When the Messiah say he who loves his mother more than me is not worthy of me or father more than me, it's basically saying that like if you're not willing to like separate from everything you've ever known in love for the most high is what he's saying. He's not saying literally hate like I hate you because, you know, we can't hate nobody. He tell us to love our brethren and love our enemies and stuff like that. He's basically saying if these people are more important to you than me, you can't be my disciple. You know what I mean? So just like we were saying when we started turning to the faith, like Sister Chris, when she was talking about her mom, her mom is in all these other things and Sister Chris turned away and then her mom and them had a disagreement, but Sister Chris don't, didn't really, wasn't really rocking with what her mom raised her in. Same thing with us, like we, we grew up Christian in Christianity and uh, my mom and my uh, aunties and family, they kind of, they bashed me for a while when I started to really get into it, you know what I mean? So at that point I didn't like, we didn't fold and say, okay, mom, you right, just let me, my mom taught me this, so this must be true. It's like, no, you got to choose the most high over everybody. So he's not saying literally hate. He's just saying, if you choose these people over me, you, you can't be my disciple. Because like Brother Phil said, they're going to hate you anyway. They're going to hate you. They're going to talk bad about you. And if that's what you care about, then you can't be my disciple. Because he told his disciples in another place, remember, if the world hates you, they hated me first. So if you gonna follow me, he's like a servant ain't better than his master. So if you gonna if you willing to follow me, just get prepared. Be prepared that a whole world hates you, including your family, right? And if you don't hate, if you don't have that type of love for me, to where they look at you and hate you, then you can't be my disciple. So he's not saying literally hate them because we know we don't we're not supposed we're not called to hate nobody. Yeah, it's a, it's a, we we gonna read it a little bit later, but. Um... You know, there's it's plenty of places in the book that says you can't hate your brother. Right. So um, but but what he's saying here, again, just like Brother T said, is it, he's talking about the world is going to see you as hating them because that's how the world is going to paint you. And you have to be OK with that. Right. So anybody who don't hate it, brother, in other words, the, as the world depicts it as, oh, I leave my family, I'm leaving everybody behind as the world depicts it. If you are not OK with that. For the sake of getting closer to the most high God, you don't, don't even don't even try to be my disciple. You know what I'm saying? You barking down the wrong dar darn tree. Right? Right? You barking down the wrong tree. You're not even ready for it. So Paul is just trying to make that process easier. He's saying, listen, it's about to get tight. That's how Paul looking at it. It's about to get real tough. When I say tight, the reason why I say that is because the path gets narrow, right? So it's going it's gonna get real tight right? It's going to be hard to do this thing. It ain't going to be a lot of room for mistakes and a lot of room for error. Listen, the less baggage you carrying, the easier it's going to be to move, right? So he's saying, look, Paul's saying, that's my advice, right? The less baggage you carrying, the easier it's going to be to move. But that's not just from Paul. How would Paul get that idea? Right? Paul, know, Paul knows our law, and that's what our law taught us, right? It taught us if we uh, go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Matter of fact, get Deuteronomy chapter 20 first. It's Deuteronomy chapter 20. Give me verse 7. I might want to start from the beginning. Tell me where I want to start. I want verse seven, though. But tell me if I if I want just verse seven or if I want to start a little bit higher. Okay, hold on. It's Deuteronomy chapter 20. We're going to look at chapter 20 and kind of figure out where we're going to start here. We'll start at verse one. All right. So this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse one. What does the book say? When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more than you, be not afraid of them, for Yahuwah your God is with you, 
which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And mm -hmm. it shall be when you are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For Yahuwah your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Mm -hmm. The officer shall speak unto the people saying, what man is there? Look, what man is there? That hath built a new house. And if you house. built a new house, listen to this. It's wartime, right? I need you focused. We got to go up against these boys and they got way more horses than us. We got to fight. So now in the time of war, the question is, Hey, who just built a new house? What did y'all sure just told, told tell us? Any man who leaves house, listen, it's gonna be a hundredfold. He had to incentivize you with a hundredfold because he knew that was a difficult decision. In the same way, now the law is telling us before we go to war, let everybody know, don't be afraid of these big old boys that's over there. These boys with more horses. Matter of fact, let me ask. Who just built a new house? Watch this. And has not dedicated it. Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man dedicated. Right? You ain't worthy of the war. You got a new house. You're not worthy of the war. Go ahead, go back. You mess around, die out there. Then somebody else take your house. You worried about your house when you out there fighting. You go, you know what I'm saying? You go, you build a new house, take your butt back. Right? What else? This our righteous law, by the way. Don't you look at these people law about how they draft people when it was World War One, World War Two, and everything. They start drafting all these people. They didn't care about none of this stuff. They start taking kids and just sending them to war, taking newlyweds and sending them to war. They didn't care about a lot of them. Didn't care. They be even the little laws they had to protect them. They had skirt around it to still try to get people. Right? Our book had our book had sympathy. We looked at it. We said, okay, you just built a house. No, nah, man, go dedicate your house before you come out here and fight. Watch it. Keep going. And what man is he that has planted, planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. Right? He said, man, you just, you just planted a vineyard? Oh, man, you're going to be out there focused on this wartime. You, you know what I'm saying? Get your butt back home and go eat your vineyard. We'll find somebody else to fight. All right? Keep going. And what man is there that has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. Right? So he's saying, listen, these are the things that a person is focused on. Even in the war, is that, listen, if you ain't had time to be with your white man, you're going to be thinking about that, man. Go ahead and go. The, this is baggage. And, and that's where that's where Paul would have shaped his understanding from just from the book. Right. Our law already describes some of this stuff and kind of gives us a hint as to what's going on. It's a marriage is a very serious thing. Right. It's a it's something that that Paul's trying to tell you. It's not a light thing. You you have other cares. He said, I will have you not be uh, have you not have carefulness. So in other words, I'm trying to give you less things to worry about is what his advice is. My advice is giving you less things to worry about because there's a lot. Right. It's a vow when you talk about marriage. And there's laws around vows. And I'm talking about not vows in, in the Catholic tradition sense where to death do us part. And you know what I'm saying? You say it in front. That I mean, it's a it's a real vow, right? That marriage is, and we have laws that govern vows, right? Numbers chapter 30. Let's go to Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30 tells us and gives us the laws around vows. Right? In all situations, whether you marry, whether you unmarry, whether you're uh, 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 a maid inside of a, um, or a daughter inside of a father's house, whether, you know what I'm saying, you're a husband of a wife and you disagree with a vow that she made. Everything, it covers it. Let's read a little bit of it and let's see if we can get an understanding. Yeah, uh, let me finish up to verse 8. Oh, my fault. Go ahead. This is, uh, this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20. This is verse 8. And the officers shall speak further unto the people and they shall say, what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house as his brother and his heart faint as well as his heart. Right? So all these scenarios he's telling you, all this stuff can cause you to not be focused on the war itself. And that's not helpful for the war at large. Right? So Paul would have understood that and been able to shape like, oh, well, you know what? It's a similar concept. 
the more stuff you have to worry about, to be careful about when in time when it, and when he says careful, it's talking about worrying. The more stuff you have to be careful about, the the more likely it is for you to be tempted away from doing what the Most High God has you to do. Right? That's the less energy that you could put towards the Most High God. So he's just saying, in theory, it's better if you were single and by yourself and you didn't have anything else to worry about because you can put 100% of your focus towards the Most High God and you ain't got to worry about calling home, seeing if your kids is all right. <laughs> Excuse me, seeing if your kids are all right. If, you're, if the Most High God said, you know what, split off, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. All right? That's something to consider. Again, it's something that I don't, I don't really hear talked about almost ever. Right. When people teach about marriage or when people. So I wanted to start with that. I wanted to make sure we understood that. But let's get into the vows. Right. Let's get into what it what what how serious the most high God takes a vow and how the book governs the vows. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord. Uh, we're in numbers 30, by the way. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she has bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she has bound her soul shall stand. But if right. So that's 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 how marriage comes about. A man and a woman make a vow. Right. And a vow is toward a covenant. Right. So you have a covenant, which is an agreement, a contract, however you want to look at it. Right. This is an agreement that we will be committed to each other. Right. For the rest of our lives. Right. It is is it is to the rest of our lives. Right. So it's. As long as one is living and we'll get into that a little bit later. But as long as one is living or as long as uh, as long as both are living, they are bound and committed to each other. They're bound by that vow. That's why the law is using that word bound. Right. So then our process is if a man wants a woman, he goes to who? The father. He goes to the father. Why would he go to the father? Because she's in her father's house. The law just tells us if she makes a vow and the father don't agree with it, he can disannul it. He can say, nope, not happening. Right? So it's advantageous for the man. He flirting with his daughter. I like her. I think this the one I want to marry. Right? I need to go to the father because legally, according to our law, I'm not talking about these people law. According to, according to our law, the father can say, not happening. I don't like this guy. Don't trust him. He ain't never been around. Usually people come up and help, you know, help in my yard. I got a vision for my daughter. I know who I want her to be with. I know the type of guy that's going to do her right. I didn't live a long time. Whatever the, the father's reason is, I just don't, maybe I don't like people from Issachar. You know what I'm saying? Like me, Pops is like, I don't really mess with Issachar like that. I'm, my daughter can't wear, marry none of those bozos from Issachar, right? Whatever his reasons is, he can call it all. So then it was advantageous for the man to say, I want to marry your daughter. Let me go to the father. Yo, yo, yo. How you doing? You know what I mean? Nice to meet you. I want you to know who I am, what I'm about. However they work out that situation, they work it out. Right? Now he can go to the daughter and ask the daughter, you know what I'm saying? Is this something that you'd like to do? Right? Now, if the daughter is saying, because a lot of people have it in their mind that we had arranged marriages. Right. And I'm not I'm not going to say we never had arranged mar marriages. Right. But a lot of people have it this concept that a woman just didn't have a choice at all in our marriage. But that's not what you see in the book. And we'll get into that, too. Right. But that's not what you see in our book. So now a father who loved his daughter. Right. He said, listen. This man came up to me. He said he want to marry you. Right. If the if the woman is sitting there like, no, nah, I don't want to marry him. And he loved his daughter. Is he going to make her marry him? No. And he can't make a vow for her. You don't see that in here. He can disannul her vow, but he can't make a vow on her behalf. Right? So the vow is between the daughter, right? The woman and the man. But the man 
goes to the the reason why our process is such that the man goes to the father because the father has the authority to disannul it, to call it off, to cancel that vow that his daughter made, right? But the so, daughter herself has to make the vow. So Sister Sharon is asking, what if the dad is just tripping? And I was told her, it's like, it don't matter. <laughs> just tripping like what? I guess like just she want to marry him and dad is saying no, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, then she got to get her, her dad, she got to leave her daddy house. Yeah. Yeah, so, she, so as long as she's under the protection of her dad, right, and the authority of her dad, he has that say according to our law. Now, if she leave his house, she say, you know what? I ain't got nothing to do with this. I'm done. I don't want your protection. And then she's, she's running around like a harlot, right? Not saying that she is a harlot, but the harlots would be put out of the father's house, right? So then now they assume responsibility for themselves, which our community wasn't set up for that. Our community wasn't set up for a woman to assume a responsibility for herself. Our community was set up for a man to always have responsibility for a woman. Right. A man always was taking care of a woman. He was always in a position to, to assist with making decisions. There was always that protection for a woman. Right. And so she could always lead a house and go about her, you know, go about her way and do whatever. But society wasn't set up like that. So that comes with its own challenges. So the incentive would be to stay with your father. If your father is just a nutball or whatever, and he's not a righteous man, and said another, then, you know, she would have to go her own way and, and try to get it on her own. This is, uh, all right, keep going. Let's see. But if her father disallow her in the day that he hears it, not any of her vows or her bonds wherewith she has bound her soul shall stand. Mm -hmm. and the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. Mm -hmm. If she had an all a husband when she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vow shall stand, and her bonds wherewith the that wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallow her on the day that he hear it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed and all that she uttered with her lips wherewith she bound her soul of none effect and the Lord shall forgive her. All right. So now she has uh, once she has a husband. Now the husband has the similar authority as the father had. Right. Where he he can dis disannul her her uh, vow. So if she make a vow, he can hear it and be like, no, 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 no. She out. Let's say she out doing business. And she making a business deal. She's like, listen, I'll tell you what. This is my company, right? I can sell you half of my company, right? This is my up. We're going to run it together. You have to handle all promotion if you buy half of it. And I'm going to hand all production, right? So I'm going to keep everything going. You're going to handle all promotion. Keep everything on social media. It's all good. She make a deal with this random person or this random company, right? But the husband hears it. According to our law, it would be no deals off. It's not a good deal. Baby, I understand that's your business. I understand that's what's going on. Not a good deal. I'm not having it. You can't go in to deal with this person. They're trying to cheat you. Right? It would be in the male's authority to make that call. Just say, nope, not happening. However, the book say, if he heard it, let's say if when they were signing the contract, the husband was there and he and, and she signed it and he was there when she signed it. Guess what? That's it. They accountable for it. Right now, there's more here. We're not going to keep going, but there's more here that even taught testifies of the gospel in that same situation. Right. This to me is the gospel. When you talk, get to the end of uh, November, uh, November, <laughs> when you get to the end of number 30th, you know what I'm saying? It's describing the gospel itself, but we won't get into that right now. We'll definitely get into that at some other time. Um, let's go back to first uh, Corinthians chapter seven. What verse we leave off on? Uh, we left off on 32. 32. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. Watch what the book say. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. What should the book say? But I, have, would, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belongs to the Lord, 
how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Mm -hmm. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord that she may be both that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. In this, I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. All right. So he's telling you, he said, I'm telling you this. Not that I'm snaring you. In other words, I'm not trying to trap you. I'm not trying to make things difficult for you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like, I'm not tricking you right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you what you need to know that it is easier to serve the most high God, to please God, in my opinion. That's how Paul's putting it, right? In my judgment, right? It is easier to serve the most high God and to please him without the extra baggage of having a wife, right? or without the extra baggage of having a husband, right? Keep going. But if any man think that he behaves himself uncomely towards his version, if she pass the flower of her age and need to require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Right? So listen, he said, listen, if any man disagree with what I'm talking about, he say, listen, I want to I wanna marry me a virgin. He's like, listen, just make sure she old enough and do what you do. Right. When you say the flower of her age, you just saying make sure she, you know, what I'm saying make sure she she grown, make sure she an adult. Keep going. Nevertheless, he that stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so decreed in his heart that he will keep his version does well. So then he that gives her in marriage does well, but he that gives her not in marriage does better. Mm hmm. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. All right. So he's telling you that the wife is bound by the law as long as the husband lives. Right. That's how marriage works. Marriage is lifelong. It's a it's a lifelong commitment. What verse is that? Thirty nine. Thirty nine. Keep going to forty nine. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think that also that I have the spirit of God. Right. So that's where you, you know, kind of being facetious. He's like, you know what I'm saying? I think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think the most I got actually called me to even write some of this stuff. Right. So, uh, so another thing when I was in the when I was in the assembly, um, I know they were saying she can only get married in the Lord. Uh, but I think they might have overlooked the part where Paul was saying, like, this is my judgment. So this is yeah, that's his judgment. Yeah, so it's not a sin if she got married to an unbeliever or something like that. You know, it's just it'll just be difficult for her, like Paul was saying. Yeah, wouldn't be advised, right? Because yeah, yeah. uh, you know, even Paul, he he gave the same thing. He said, he said, you know what I'm saying, should we be unequally yoked? Right. And a lot of people use that for a lot of reasons, right? I just heard they uh use that thing. They abuse yeah, that buddy. Thing. Yeah, you know I'm saying I just heard somebody talking about, you know what I'm saying. A rich man shouldn't be with a with a with a with a woman that don't got a lot of money because they're not equally yoked and vice versa. And, uh, you know what I'm saying? A woman, you know what I'm saying, don't need no broke dude <clears throat> because they're not un unequally yoked. You know what I'm saying? It's like y'all choose whoever y'all want to choose, but don't try to use the book to justify what y'all doing or how y'all move. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, unequally yoked is talking about um our what we believe, right? And if we looked at, we ain't got to get it right now, but if we looked at when he he described that, he was talking about. You know what I'm saying? What what um <clears throat> I think it's like what association does the does the temple of Yah have with idols? Right? It wasn't talking about how much money or somebody had or anything like that. It's just talking about if I'm devoting myself to God, <clears throat> why would I be yoked? In other words, why would I be attached to somebody who is devoting themselves to some other God? Right? It just wouldn't make sense. Um, and we'll talk about unequally yoked in, in that idea too. Remember a yoke is a device that like a, a ox or something will wear right so you wrap the ox the ox neck in this this wooden device or this device and the device would be attached to another ox ox so then what you would do is you would slap the ox on their butt and then they would start walking and let's say you was you was using them to turn the threshing floor they would start walking around in the circle and this device would keep them to where all the energy that they use to walk it would cause them to go in a circle. So it keeps them yoked and it keeps them in bondage to walk in this circle as opposed to just walking around freely. So 
if you're unequally yoked and you have and you have one ox that's really really big and the other one small then things are not going to run right because one is going to be running faster than the other and they're going to get disjointed and all that so you would have to find ox that kind of are even right that way when they walk they walk and they have the same person, the purpose. They're going to just about the same speed and things work out right. Right. So that's what he just that's what unequally yoked uh, is talking about. But when he's actually using it, he's using it talking about equal in the sense of what the belief is, what the faith is. Um, grab uh, Romans chapter seven. <clears throat> it's Romans chapter seven. Give me verse one. It's Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Right? So the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. When he says man, he's talking about both male and female. Right? So now the law has the dominion over a man as long as he lives. Watch how he brings it to the female. For well, the woman which has a husband is bound by the law of her husband, so mm -hmm. long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of the husband. Right? So that that vow that we just talked about, that vow is on to death, right? Paul's explaining the law to us. And he's telling us, look, you know how the law works. The law is in effect until a person dies. Right? That's the end of the law. Right. Death is the end of the law. Right. So a law is in effect until a person dies. He's saying, listen, the woman, she's still legally married to the male, no matter what happens, until the man dies. After he dies, now she's loose. That's where the, the term widow comes from. Right. And as a widow, now she can be remarried to another male. She would not be able to be remarried to another male until she's either divorced or until she becomes a widow so he's saying that law of the marriage obviously because we deal with widows he said that is only until she uh her husband dies right keep going so then if her if while her husband lives she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress she'll be called a what an adulteress notice he didn't call her a fornicator right a lot of people get the idea that fornication covers adultery too, and this, that, and are they the same words or they can be used interchangeably? And I know when you look up your little Strong's dictionary, it'll tell you fornication, adultery, and tell you, but you can't do that. These are people that write these definitions. That's not how you try to understand Hebrew words or Greek words or whatever words that we read in our book. The way you understand them is you see how was the word translated consistently throughout the book. Not what somebody's opinion was about the word, not what they read in some other book or how the word was used. Because we got all types of words, right? We got all types of words and we use them for all types of reasons. We call it slang. Right? If I tell you right now, oh boy, I was watching that movie. That thing was fire. Right? If I tell you that right now, everybody knows what I'm talking about. 700 years from now, maybe they don't. They get to looking up, well, the Oxford Dictionary says fire, it comes from a flame, something burning. Did he say that the movie theater burned down? Or you right, they were trying to read what I'm saying, and they don't understand what I'm talking about. What you happened? Can, you can use something even more recent, like Cap. You know what I mean? Cap was like, when we were young, Cap wasn't talking about lying. I didn't know what was Cap. I didn't know. When these kids started saying Cap, like, that's Cap. I'm like, what in the world are they talking about? That's Cap. What do you mean? Are you capping? What? We used to use capping. Listen, my my uncles used to use capping for talking about somebody. Yeah. When I was young, it was like, man, they capping on you. You know what I mean? So it's like these words are you reused and changed and used for other reasons and all this stuff. So even if I say all that to say that, yes, you will likely be able to find fornication used interchangeably with adultery in some other Greek book, right? You will not find it once in the scripture. You just won't find it. You won't find the word used for fornication used to describe adultery, not once in our book, right? 
And the reason for that is because it's not interchangeable. That's not that's not really how it was. He called her an adulteress for a reason. That's important because we'll get to that later, too. But keep reading. What verse is that? Actually, that's verse three. Yeah. All right. Uh, read verse three for me again, just so I can make sure we got so it. If while her husband lives, she be married to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that vow so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Right. So he's just telling you it's legal for a wife to be married after her husband dies. Right. So I, I, I want to pause there and I want to kind of recap and kind of look at what we know so far. Marriage is a thing that the most high God set up. It's a good thing. Right. A man who 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 find a good wife um, will uh, uh, find favor with the most high God. Right. That's book. I know a lot of people abuse that thing and use it, but it is book. Right. It's book. The book says it. It's a good thing. It's all there. Right. So. If we keep going, right, and we look at it, we also see that maybe, right, maybe it's better for you to focus on God and not be married at all. If you can handle it, right? It's not a sin to get married. You ain't got to worry, but it's less baggage. You have more time, more energy to focus on the most high God than to focus on, on what pleases your spouse, right? So that's important. Also, we learned that the vow itself is a heavy vow. Right. The most high God holds you accountable to that vow. And that vow is unto death. Right. You will be bound by that vow until you die. Right. Or until your spouse dies, one or the other. Right. So it's not a light thing to get married. And maybe there's some benefits to not getting married. Right. Once we understand that now you got some decisions to make. Right. As a single person. Right. You got some decisions to make. You say, OK, well. You know what I'm saying? Well, how do I find a wife? Because we make it deep, right? Especially when you, once you understand the gravity, like when I talk to people that, that's about to get married or they're thinking about getting married, I always try to make sure they understand the gravity of it. Like, this is a serious thing. This is, this is a big deal. This is a commitment. This is a long, you've never made a commitment like it, right? You've never made a commitment like it. There's no way out. Once you enter the door, you are in there. You stuck. Close it behind you. You never going back out that door again. Right? That's what's happening. You done. That's it. Right? It's a great thing. It's beautiful. And there's a lot of benefits to it. But make sure you understand the vow. Right? Then people get deep. I see it all the time when I talk to them. They get deep. They be like, oh, well, I've been praying that God send me my husband. Right? I've been praying that, that, that God just... Just find the good, the white, the right wife for me. When we read in Proverbs, did it say when God findeth your wife? No, no, no. It said when a man findeth his wife. You know what I'm talking about? That's your choice. You go out and you pick who you want. Right? And that just don't go for the man. That go for the woman too. Right? It ain't like just because a man come talk to you that you got to marry him. And it ain't like a man got to come talk to you in some special way to let you know this is a sign from God. This is the one. And you got to wait for God to choose your husband. The book tell us to choose what we want. We got that freedom. As long as we serve God, that ain't just got to do with, with choosing a wife and a husband. Anything, as long as we serve God and we adhere to the, what the Messiah says, the whole world is at our door. We could do whatever we want as long as it doesn't offend what the Messiah says, right? That goes for everything, every choice we make, every color we want in our car, our house, in our clothes, whatever it is, it just cannot offend the principles that Yahushua laid out for us, right? Of course, now, if I want to go wear clothes that offends that principle, then that's a sin, right? But I can choose whatever article of clothes I want outside of that. I just can't offend it. I can choose whatever woman Whatever man as a woman, right, I won't, it doesn't matter as long as it doesn't offend. That is the important piece. And the, we have to get that through our head because then we can exhale a little bit. We ain't got to be sitting here scared, praying before every, every date that we might have or anything like that. We can sit here and be like, you know what? I'm going to use what I want, my judgment, my experiences, the things I've heard, the advice I've gotten. And that's how I'm going to determine the type of man or the type of woman I should marry. Right. Let's go to um, let's go to uh, Numbers chapter 36. Right. And while the brother is turning there, 
Numbers chapter 36 talks to us about it's a follow up conversation. Right. So there was a man named uh, Zelophehad, I think. Right. And Zelophehad, um, I'm probably saying that wrong. When you get it to you, help me out. <laughs> yeah, but was uh, Zelof- I think that's it. OK. When, Z- when Zelophehad, um, when Zelophehad uh, uh, died, he yeah. had only daughters. Right. The way our our uh, culture work is we pass down heritage through the male. Right. So if I'm a father. My heritage, in other words, my name, who I am, my lineage, everything, my 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 property goes to my children. Right. All of my children. Right. But my male children, when they get married and they have children, the 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 property passes through them to the next generation, whereas their wife, it does not pass through them. Right. So. The lineage is always passed through the males of the family. It's not passed through the females of the family. So Zelophehad only had daughters, which meant that whatever male they married would assume all of the lineage or all of the uh, all of the heritage that passed down to them. So in other words, I give all my possessions to my daughter when I die, right? Because I only have daughters. My daughters have the possessions. Now, they are called my daughters, but when they get married, they take on the inheritance of their husband. So now the name, my name is wiped off because I don't have anybody else that can pass down my heritage. So now I'm kind of erased from the future. Right. Because I only had daughters and I can't pass down my heritage through my daughters. My daughters are going to inherit the heritage of their husbands. Right. So this was a follow up conversation to a conversation that they had like, hey, what do we do in this situation for the father of our tribe that only had daughters and we want to continue his legacy? Right. This is a uh, uh, numbers, chapter 36, verse one. And the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Maker and the son of Manasseh of the families of the son of Joseph came near and spoke before Moses. And before the princes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, and they said, the Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughters. And if they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from their inheritance of our fathers and shall be put to the inheritance of the tribe where, where they are to, where into they are received. Right. So he said, listen, he's like, previously you gave advice or you gave a commandment that these women could go get married, but they keep the inheritance. Or no, these women would keep the inheritance from their father. Right. Normally. Right. The inheritance would go to sons. And and then you could just say, "Okay, all the sons get the land because what they worried about is we about to go divide up this land, this section of the territory. Belongs to the children of uh, Joseph. What was it, Manasseh? It was Manasseh, right? Yeah, Manasseh. Yeah, so the children of Manasseh, right? So now this is Manasseh's territory. But this part of the territory, let's say it's right smack in the middle of Manasseh, right? This part of the territory was given to Zelophehad. Zelophehad only had daughters. So now his daughters own that part of the territory. But then when somebody from Judah come and they say, ooh, Zelophehad daughter, I want to marry her. Guess what? All of that territory is now owned by Judah. So they looking like if this happens and if we continue to have daughters and not sons, technically the other tribes are going to be able to steal away all of our land. So now in the middle of Manasseh, you're going to have territory for Judah. And they looking like that don't really make sense. So let's keep going. Let's see how, how the most high God kind of saw for this. And they said, the Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded, commanded by the Lord to give an inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughters. And mm-hmm. if they be married to the sons of any other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and shall be put in the inheritance of the tribe wherein they are received. So it mm-hmm. shall be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the children of Israel shall be. Then shall their inheritance be put into the inheritance of the tribes whereunto they are received. So shall their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribes of our fathers. 
And Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph have Joseph has said, Well, this is the thing which the Lord does command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry to whom they think best. What? Let them marry to whom they think best. Listen, the most high God is not demanding that he chooses your husband. These are women, and he's telling the women, let the women marry whoever they think is best. Right? They choose. We choose. This is not something like don't don't make it too deep for yourself. Don't put all this pressure on yourself that you know what? God has to choose this. God has to sin. You choose. You make the choice and you own that decision. That is very important for your vow. It is going to be very difficult for your vow if you don't take accountability and responsibility for your choice and who you dealt with. Once you accept that, right? Once you accept and you say, you know what? This is who I like. I love this person. These are the reasons, right? He treated me nice. And then after that, he's been consistent with me and he's been a good leader and he interacts well with my family and we have the same values and we both want this many children and all these reasons. Right. You think about them consciously, put them at the forefront of your head. This, these are the reasons I'm making this decision. This is the reason I want to marry this man or this is the reason I want to marry this woman. Right. Be conscious of it. Understand and note that these are my reasons that I came up with that I am choosing. Right. Then after you do that, you get married because there's going to come a time where things are going to be challenged and you're going to find out some of the stuff that you thought you didn't assess it properly. Or it's some stuff that you just missed, you ignored. But it's easier to deal with that when you say, you know what, at the time, this is everything that I considered. I can I, I really was thoughtful about it. I just didn't have all the information, but. At the time, that's the decision I made. And I know why I made that decision at the time. Right? Then you just work through whatever you whatever you later found out. But it's harder to make that decision when you feel like, oh, I was waiting on God and I really felt like God sent me this man. Because now accountability is off you and now you put it on God. Or you put it on the devil. Like, God, devil, you tricked me into thinking that that was God that sent me this man. And you can't solve for that. There's no way to work through that. Now you convince yourself that you've been deceived by the devil in the marrying this person. Well, that's not true. You weren't deceived by the devil in the marrying this person. You might have been deceived by that person through the devil, but you weren't deceived to marry that person. You chose to marry based off of what situation, whatever you observed, whatever you liked at the time. Right? Take the vow seriously. Think it through understand why you're making that decision and never let go of that right because it's going to be a time where emotionally you're going to feel different right but when you feel different emotionally that does not overweigh the the vow the vow has to work through emotion it don't matter how you feel love is not about how you feel right all the stuff about in love and all that is not about how you feel it's not about how you feel it's about the commitment it's about the vow. Once you make a vow, you say, hey, look, this is how we're going to roll. That's love. When people talk about unconditional love, that's a fake. That's a fake idea, first of all. But if the closest thing to unconditional love is saying, no matter what happens, I'm committed to you. Right. Even if even if whatever, whatever you want to put after that, even if right, even if whatever, I am still committed to you and we still married and I'm still bound by this vow. That's the closest thing you're going to get to unconditional love. What would the world tell you that you're doing? You settling. You ain't got to put up with that. You ain't got to diss that and other. The world is going to tell you all types of stuff, right? But remember, these are the same people that tell you they want unconditional love. The world is going to tell you they want unconditional love. And then when you find yourself in a position where somebody is perceived as doing you wrong, they're going to tell you, you ain't got to put up with that. Because the world, they hypocrites. You can't use this stuff. You got to look at our book. The book, it, it's not about this feeling, this emotion. It ain't about you're going to be happy someday. You're going to be sad someday. It, no matter what it is, what our job, when we first started our job, you know, I'm a, the jobs that we had when we first started, we said, oh, we were so happy. Some of us say, oh, this is the best job I've ever had. And you still have good days and you still have bad days. 
You still have days you want to go into work. You still have days you don't want to go into work. I love my job. I never had a job as good as the job I had. I love my job. I love going to work most of the time. But there's still some days I don't want to go to work. There's still some days where I sit there, you know, like, oh, my goodness, these people, these people. Oh, my God, I don't want to go to this meeting. It, that's just how it works. That's how marriage is. That's how anything is, right? You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have times where you emotionally feel great, times where you don't emotionally feel great. Either way, you have to be committed to the vow that you make to your wife or to your husband, right? Everything else set aside. How do you deal with those challenges when you get there? One thing, the first thing you got to know is, why did, why am I here in the first place? Oh, because I chose. I chose my husband. God didn't choose my husband, right? Satan didn't choose my husband. You know what I'm saying? Somebody else didn't choose my husband. I made an agreement to choose my husband. Always had options. Even if you feel like you was in an arranged marriage and your father made you do it, you still had options. I could have, like Sister Sharon said, I could have skated. Right? I could have left. I could have took whatever the consequences were and I could have lived out on the street by myself without support. But you know what? I chose not to do that because at the time I felt that it would be harder to live on the street than it would be to live with this man. Own those decisions. You have to hold your accountable, yourself accountable. To, it doesn't mean that it's fair. doesn't mean that it's right. But own the decision. I had a choice. And at the time, given the options that I thought I had at the time, this is what I chose. Once you acknowledge that and you take that, it becomes easier to work through the rest of it. But you don't need to fight against just imagination while you're doing it. It's imagination to say, no, God sent this man into my life. So, you know, it must have been we getting divorced, but it, it, he must have sent him in my life for a reason. So I learned from that situation to go to my. That's a lie. That's a lie. Don't put that stuff on God because it'll make you when we put stuff on God, we make the situation right, no matter how wrong it is. Right. Well, I know for it because you spent your whole the whole beginning of your marriage. You spent it walking around talking about, oh, well, you know, no, God sent her to me, bro. Oh, no, 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 God, I'm telling you, God brought her to me and he told me this, that, and the other. And he told me I should, I should marry this wife. Then 10 years down the later, you get, you get divorced. And now you can't renege on all this stuff you said God told you. You got to hold on to that. So now you got to be like, well, no, 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 God sent her. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't the reason I thought. You know what I'm saying? I thought it was for us to be together for the rest of our life. Mm -mm. Mm, God sent her to teach me a few things. Teach me that some of these women do X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no. Don't move the goalpost. You chose her because that's what you liked. You was burning with lust. You didn't want to, you know what I'm saying? Whatever the reason is, you chose her. And nothing's wrong with that decision. You can choose whoever you want. You just got to deal with whatever it come with it. Whatever that come with it, whatever you thought you was going to get versus whatever reality was, deal with that reality. Right? Deal with it. Keep moving. Take accountability for the decision. Go. But it ain't on them. It's on you. It's on you made the choice. That was the most high God said. Most high God said, let the daughters of Zalofa had choose whoever they think is best. Choose the best person for their situation. Right? We don't got to keep reading there. That's the only part I really wanted us to get to. But just to seal up the, the story as the loaf I had, finish out that verse for me. Only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. So shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to the inheritance of the tribe of, the, of his fathers. All right. Grab uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven real quick. Because the next question is going to be, well, you know, because you know we got a couple Hebrew Israelites. I mean, we got some Hebrew Israelites in here. You know we got a couple Hebrew Israelites that going to end up watching. Right? So they're going to be looking like, yeah, well, you know what I'm saying? He just told them that they got to choose within the tribe. He told them under this condition, you got to choose within the tribe. One, you only have daughters. You don't have, I mean, you only have sisters. You don't have any brothers. And your father is dead. That's the condition to where you have to marry within your own tribe. Outside of that, you marry whoever you think best. And even within your tribe in that condition where you only have sisters, or let me say it this way, you don't have any brothers, right? You've never had any brothers. That's what it has to be, right? You've never had any brothers and your father is no longer living. In those conditions, you got to marry who was in your tribe, but still even within your tribe, whoever you think best. Well, now... We don't know what tribe we from. 
And don't be listening to them Hebrew Israelites that tell you, oh, yeah, if you're Mexican, you have the tribe of, you know what I'm saying? What they be calling the Mexicans? I don't know. It, you know what I'm saying? If you Hawaiian, one of them had Hawaiians on there. I was like, y'all are crazy. <laughs> it's like, what is wrong with y'all? If you Hawaiian, you of this tribe. Yeah, everybody got a tribe somehow. Right? You cannot listen to these people. They don't know what they're talking about. Do not do it's not like, accept that as the tribe. There like is going to be, huh? It's like reverse Christianity as the come as you are thing. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly it's every everybody except a white, uh, uh, the white races got they from a tribe. Everybody is Israel, except for the white people. That's that crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, stop that. You just stop the fool. Why did you get a white man a tribe, bro? You out of line. <laughs> yeah, stop the foolishness. That stuff is crazy. Right. But yeah, don't believe that's the the most high God is going to send the prophets and they're going to come and they're going to restore all things to us. And they're going to tell us what tribes we we from. Just wait on the most high God for that. Yeah, I'm fine with do your research. Right. Do your research. And if if you as an individual are able to make a connection all the way back to, you know, what I'm saying all the way back to our land and say, no, nah, I know for a fact that I'm from this tribe. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I ain't telling you that's wrong to do that. I'm just saying, don't believe these people who at large swash can just say, Oh yeah, this all this people is from this tribe. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. If people can't come to you with well thought out research. I'm not talking about, oh, the Jamaicans do this. And Deuteronomy says that, you know what I'm saying, the tribe of Iskar is gonna do this. And that looked like what the Jamaicans do. So that must be the all the Jamaicans must be that. That's poor, that's poor, that's poor, that's poor research, that's poor understanding of the book. That's cheap stuff. Don't go for that weird old stuff that they people be, that's just linking stuff. They're just dreaming and grasping that straw. Just just doing silly stuff to try to make people believe stuff. Right? Go with what the books say. If you got some research you're going to do and some real research and it tie you all the way back, ain't nothing wrong with it. You know what I'm saying? If you got it, you got the research and you believe the research that you're in, then rock with it. That's fine. You know what I'm saying? But just don't believe these boys that just, you know what I'm saying, put their finger in our sky. You know, yeah, I believe this is the case. And then speak it to you like it's fat. Boy, they're liars. All right, this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Give me verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land where you go to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites. Look, he cast out many nations before thee. Watch this. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites. The Hittites, the Girgashites. Amorites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations greater and how many? Than thou. Seven nations. It's seven nations. That's all he told you about. He didn't tell you 17. He didn't tell you all the white folks. He didn't tell you nothing. He said seven nations. Right? Watch this. Keep going. And when thy Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show. You said don't make any covenant with them. In other words, don't make no vows to these people. And what else? Nor show mercy to uh, no show mercy unto them. Mm -hmm. Neither shall thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his sons, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy sons. Right. So he's saying either way, don't give your sons. I mean, don't have give their daughters to your sons and don't give your daughters to their sons. Either way, don't make any marriages with them. Don't make any covenants with them. Right. That is our law. Seven nations. Let's read them again. What are the seven nations? Hittites. The Hittites. Girgashites. The Girgashites. Amorites. The Amorites. Canaanites. The Canaanites. Perizzites. The Perizzites. And the Hivites. And the Hivites. And the Jebusites. Huh? And the Jebusites. They ain't seven. And the Jebusites. Yeah, put your finger up. The next one is the Jebusites. Oh, I'm counting wrong. I thought I was already a seven. The <laughs> Jebusites. That's seven. Hey, beautiful. Okay, daddy got to work, okay? Right? So that's seven. Boom. The Jebusites. That's it. You didn't hear Edom in there? Did you? No. Did you hear Moab? No. Did you hear Ammon? Mm -mm. Did you hear Syria? Nope. You didn't right? Hear Egypt. Didn't hear Egypt either. Didn't hear Egypt. You didn't hear Rome. You didn't hear Greece. You didn't hear Italy. Well, I guess that's Rome, right? You didn't hear. You didn't hear. You didn't hear any of these. You didn't hear the Spaniards. You didn't hear the the Portuguese, right? You didn't hear any of these other nations in here. 
the Europeans, right? You didn't hear any of these people. He told you seven nations specifically, and he told us to go wipe them out. Now, yeah. <laughs> you seem famished. <laughs> the law also say, you know, if we go to a war, if we go to war to a faraway country and we want to marry some of those women, the law told you how to do that also. Right? Yeah, our law told us how, how we could deal with people of a faraway country. Yeah. Right? So when people, when the Hebrew Israelite, the reason why I bring this up is because the Hebrew Israelite will have you believe that we aren't to marry Gentiles. Like we aren't to give our, our children to Gentiles. Or have Gentiles marry our children. Right? And that's not book. You'll never read it in the book. In fact, if you look at Yahushua himself, Yahushua comes from Ruth, and Ruth was a Moabite. Right? We read it. Right? Ruth ended up being with Boaz. Well, Boaz is, is David's great, 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 great grandfather. Right? And David, I mean, and Yahushua is the son of David. Right. And that was right after we got into the land. Ruth is right when we got into the land. So let's go to the other one. This is uh this is uh Deuteronomy chapter 23. Right? There's another one that people misunderstand. So we just talked about inheritance, right? Inheritance comes from the father. That applies to Gentiles too. So if you got a Gentile father, right? then you've inherited that whatever Gentile nation he's from. If your, if, your, if your father is from Greece, right, then that makes you a Grecian in our mind. When we look at it, you're as good as a Grecian. I don't care if your mama a Hebrew. You're as good as a Grecian, right? So now let's read Deuteronomy chapter 23 because it's another one they use to try to say we can't be with Gentiles. And it was an example in... Uh... I think it was Joshua when they were saying, like, you know, the father of an Edomite that had the Hebrew mom, they wasn't they didn't really count him among, you know, themselves. Yeah, yeah. If you if you if your father ain't a Hebrew, then technically you wouldn't be considered us. And Timothy also in the New Testament, uh, I think his father was a Greek and his mom was a Hebrew. Yep. He said Deuteronomy, what? 23, verse 1. He that is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his 10th generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Right. So what it's saying, the first one, he said wounded in the stones. That means somebody who, who, you know what I'm saying? Their genitals have been mutilated in some way. They was deformed in some way um, or their stuff was cut off somehow. You know what I'm saying? He said, they are not welcome into the congregation of Yahuwah. So what, what's the congregation of Yahuwah? Uh, that time it would have been the tabernacle, the temple. Yeah, whenever we all gather together mm -hmm. to serve Yahuwah, right, you're not welcome. Right? So they would have, these are people that would have to be on the outskirts with leprosy. Like the people that are leprous, they would have to be on the outskirts with them. Right? So if you, let's say you were born deformed, you know, you know how they used to talk to us about hermaph hermaphrodites. I'm telling you, people be thinking they have something. They'd be like, okay, well, you talk to gay people and they trying to tell you it's okay to be gay. Well, what about a hermaphrodite where they're born, born with both parts? Oh, don't worry. I got, a, I got, I got scripture for that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you think I ain't got an answer for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, I got an answer. No, no, no. They wounded and they stones. They but got to go on the outskirts and they got to be a unit. Right? Now you just got to make yourself, now you got to take what Paul said. You know what I'm saying? It better just be single. Right? That's the situation. It don't, it don't matter what you throw, there's book for it. The book is either going to be, it ain't no book for that, so do whatever you want. Or the book is going to be, it's book for that, this is how you got to handle it. But no matter what you come up with, it's book for it. All right? Keep going. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter to the congregation of the Lord. Look, it said the Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahuwah. Okay? So now, let's take what we've, we've gotten so far, right? We're saying so far that if you're wounded in the stones, right, you cannot enter into the congregation. If you are an illegitimate bastard, right, illegitimate, you cannot enter into the congregation. 
right? Next, Moabite, Ammonite, cannot enter into the con congregation. Watch what he says next, though. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his 10th generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. So he said a illegitimate Ammonite or Moabite cannot enter until the 10th generation. Oh, yeah. The Ammonite and the Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their 10th generation. shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Right. So what he's trying to let you know is if you are someone born, right, he's talking about illegitimates. If you were someone born of an Ammonite father. Just because you got a Hebrew mama, even down to the tent. So even the kids that come from that situation, even down to the tent, if none of them have Hebrew fathers. You cannot enter into the congregation. It's what you got to be on the outskirts if you want to be around us. If you want to walk and you want to obey our laws, that's fine. But you got to be on the outskirts. You cannot go into the congregation. Right? Keep going. Because they met you not with bread and with water on, in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God will not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Thou shalt mm -hmm. not see their peace, nor their prosperity, all the days forever. Watch what you say next. Thou shalt not. So you know, you know the, you know these uh, Hebrew Israelites. They're gonna tell you that you know Edom is the white man, and you gotta hate Edom and all this stuff. Watch this. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. He said, "Look, this is law. Do not hate the Edomite." He is your brother. This is law. All these law keepers that believe this Edomite stuff, all of them is in there. They in there about who Edom is, and they in there about even if he was who they thought he was, they in there about how they treat him. Right? You shall not hate an Edomite. He is thy brother. What else? Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian because you were a stranger in his land. Mm -hmm. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. Right. The children that are begotten of them shall enter in the third generation. Begotten is from a male. When the book says begotten, every time you see it, it's always a male who begots. You don't use that language for a woman. A woman is they're going to say something like bear. Right. But a, a male begots a, a, a child. Begets. Right. So it's talking it's talking to you about when the father is of these nations. Just because you got a Hebrew mom, it still doesn't make it appropriate for you to enter into the congregation. It is not telling you that you can't marry these nations. In fact, he's, he's telling you, he's detailing out how you should handle when someone is married and have children through one of these nations. He's telling you how to handle it. Right? But he's not talking about a male to a woman. And that's how you end up getting Yahushua. Because we talked about the Moabites, and they say even to the 10th generation, right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 1 real quick, real quick, because there's so much more we got to go through. It's Matthew chapter 1. And give me verse 1. The book of the generations of Yahushua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brethren, and Judah begot Phirez, and Zerah, and Tamar, and Phirez begot Ishram, Ishram, and Ishram begot Aram, and Aram begot Amenadab, and Amenadab begot Nashon. Look, so Nashon, look, so Nashon, Nashon, Amenadab, and Nashon is Moses' time. Right? Those are the folks, if you read Numbers, uh, Nashem is the one who led Judah whenever Judah, it was time to move. He was the head of Judah. Right. So that's be, Moses time. It could be uh, Nathan in, in, in the law. Is it Nathan? Said what? Is it Nathan in the law or Nashon? Because I know from from the Old Testament to the New Testament, like it's like pronounced like it's spelled different, but it's the same name. No, not Nathan. This was no, this one's Nashem. Nashem. Okay. So in the law, it says Nashem with an S.H. Okay. Yeah, in numbers, and if you read, I think it's like numbers in the beginning of numbers. It's numbers one ten, or maybe it's ten one, maybe like that. But um, it's uh, 
it's, it's in the beginning of numbers it tell you how how nashem used to lead out the people of uh of uh judah right and then nashem is how it's spelled in, in the new testament but it's talking about the same person yeah right and if you look at it it'll, you you would even in, in the genealogies it got the same father and everything so right there it's telling you that this is moses time this is the time that moses was walking around so let's take it from here and let's count how many generations until we get to root right if the if it was unlawful for a Moabite, right, to come into uh, the congregation, and that means that we can't marry that within ten generations, let's count how many generations until we get to root. So we had Nathan right now. Let's keep going. And Nathan begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz mm -hmm. begot Obed of Ruth. Right. So Obed came from Ruth. That is only four generations. Yeah, but wouldn't that wouldn't that like not really count because the fathers are Hebrew? It wouldn't count because the fathers are Hebrew. That's my point. Yeah. Right. My point is the only reason this works is because it's only been four generations. So had the if this was not talking about the fathers, this would be unlawful. That would do it. What we would have to say is the the uh, the Messiah. And the king came from an unlawful land, right? So that's four generations from there. And we got a Moabite, right? But let's count until David, right? David became the king, right? So let's see how many generations till we get to David, who was, who was a product of this Moabite. And Obed begot Jesse. Mm-hmm. And, and Jesse begot David. And Jesse begot, that's six generations to David. Still haven't reached our 10. And technically, the count should have started with Ruth. If 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 what we read in, in Deuteronomy 23 is referring to all Gentiles, no matter if it's mother or father, then the count should have started with Ruth. And you really only got two generations. But I'm being liberal. Let's let's take it all the way back. Let's take it back as far as we can. You can't get but six generations. And Nathan started before Moses gave that Deuteronomy law. So it's really I'm getting, being liberal with the count. I'm giving you more. Right. There's no way to do it. Because when it says begot, it's talking about the father. It's not talking about it's not talking about just any old marriage or anything else. I say this to say, choose who you want. Choose who you want. The only law that we have against marrying someone outside of our people is those seven nations. Right. And uh, Sister Pamela asked the question, like, how in the world are we supposed to know if they have those seven nations? Two things. We killed them all. Right. The most high God killed them all. Technically. Right. He wiped them all. That was part of the prophecy that they would be judged and they'd be killed all. But let's say some of them survived. Right. Some of them survived. If you don't have any evidence <laughs> to say that these people are connected to. Um, Canaan. Huh? Canaan. To Canaan. Yeah. To the Canaanites. Then that's fine. Now, if that's your reasoning, if, you, if your reasoning is, I believe this person to be connected to a Canaanite, then don't marry him. I'm not telling you you have to marry these Gentiles. I'm not even telling you that you should marry a Gentile. You should marry your own people. Right? I'm just telling you don't feel condemned because you married a Gentile. Don't let nobody tell you that you're doing something wrong because you married a Gentile. But y'all, I'm well documented in my belief. You know what I'm saying? I'm well documented in what I'll tell you. You marry a darn. I feel, look, most of the time, especially in our captivity, if, if, a, if a Hebrew man go get him a non-Hebrew person, most of the time, I think he's weak. That's me personally. That's my personal thought. That's not this. I think it's weak. I think, I think as a man who's in this captivity that deals with, with the judgment of our people, I think it's our responsibility to lead about the women of our people. Right? Because our women going to be dealing with curses that a lot of these other Gentiles ain't dealing with. And yes, it's going to be easy for you to go get, you know what I'm saying, one of these people that's not under our curses. Right. That's going to be simple for you. Right. But it's going to be hard for somebody who's not of our people to understand the complexity to come behind a black woman. That's going to be difficult for them. They're not going to get it. Right. And that's going to leave our women unprotected out here. But yeah, I think it's weak. that's Egypt because I think it, it ain't nothing wrong with it. You do what you want to do. Get what you want. Maybe you listen. We under stuff too. We haven't been given the tools to lead about a woman. Then on top of that, then we got to deal with the stress that comes with, 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 you know what I'm saying? Being under the curse 
of ourselves, then the stress of our woman being under the curse too. That can be difficult. So maybe I do need to tuck and hide and go get me a little, you know what I'm saying? Go get me something else. Right? That's fine. Do whatever you got to do. First thing is, first thing first, seek the kingdom. After that, I don't care who you choose. That ain't none of my darn business. I'm just giving you my opinion. When it comes to the book, choose who you choose. Right? Don't let none of these people make you feel guilty about who you choose, make you feel wrong with who you choose. Right? This is, uh, let's shoot through this stuff. We got a lot that we got to get to. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Right? So we're going back to uh, 1 Corinthians. We start, kind of started, you know what I'm saying, a little lower. Brother T made a good point. So I wanted to, I wanted to kind of go into 1 Corinthians 7 and uh, started verse, I think we started at verse 25. But let's go back up to verse 1. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Look, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Watch this. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Now that's the same Paul. When he talked about cheating on your husband, what did he use? Adultery. He said adultery, didn't he? Now when he's talking about, hey, it's good for a man not to marry or not to touch a woman. He said, however, to avoid fornication, everybody should have their own wife, right? Fornication and adultery are not the same thing. You can see them used. A lot of people say that lie. And again, I know when you look up the Strong's definition and all that, it does say adultery there. I get it. I know. I understand what you're talking about. I don't trust them. You use it how it's been translated in the book. Look at how the book translated. That's the only definition we, we're using around here. Keep going. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and mm-hmm. likewise unto the wife, likewise the wife unto the husband. Right. When they say due benevolence, it's talking about, you know what I'm saying? It's just saying be good to your get uh be good to your wife, is what it's saying. When it says do benevolence, be good to your wife. She's she's old. It's your duty to be good to your wife, is basically what it's saying. And likewise, the wife unto the husband. Mm-hmm. The wife has not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband has not power of his own body, but the wife. Mm-hmm. Defraud you not one, of, one another, except it be for a consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But right, so look, he said, not- look, this, I'm speaking by permission. In other words, I'm doing this of myself. This is not a commandment. He said, if it were up to me, I would have it that everybody was just like me. In other words, single. Right? Keep going. But every man has his proper gift of God. One after this manner and after and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain... Let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Right? So what he's telling you here is, although, so we read already that, that he was telling us, listen, it's better to be by yourself, in my opinion. That's what, that's what Paul was saying. In my opinion, it's better for you to be by myself. That's my judgment on the situation. Right? Because you got less to worry about. But then here he's telling you, listen, if it come down to it, and the option is you burning, in other words, you committing fornication, or being married, I prefer for you to be married. Or not, I prefer. It's better for you to be married, right? Because one is going to lead you to a sin. So that's something else that we have to think about, right? If we say, you know what? Hey, Brother Phil, you know, I'm happy that that you exposed to me that, you know what I'm saying? It's actually a good thing not to be married. But then you find yourself in a situation where you tempted on to burning, right? In other words, tempted on to going to hell because of fornication. It would be better for you personally, instead of dealing with the burn of lust, it would be better for you to end up being married. Right. If those are your choices. Right. Now, if you can control yourself and you can have that self-control and, 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 and be by yourself and remain by yourself and you're comfortable with it, then do what you got to do. Right. Sir, the most high God, just focus. But if now you being single creates the same distraction or a similar distraction to where now you fighting with this lust all the time, you can't focus on God doing that. 
So you got to choose. All this stuff is choices, but you're free to make these choices, right? All this stuff is choices. You say, okay, well, listen, if I get married, I'm out to deal with the household. I'm out to deal with my wife, what makes her happy, you know, kind of had this relationship, build it. I'm out to pay more money for, for all of our living expenses, whatever it might be. Right. For from a white perspective, I'm out to serve my husband. I'm out to be accountable to him. I'm out to do this. I'm out to take care of these kids and make sure that they raise. I'm out whatever, whatever roles. Right. Well, you know, what I'm saying you can have whatever roles you want in your household as long as the male is the head. Right. You, you could have whatever roles you want in your household. But whatever roles that you say, this is what I'm gonna have to deal with. Whereas if I'm single, I'm just going to be single. I ain't got to worry about nothing else. But you know what? I will burn with lust. I will burn with passion. I will have all these things that I'm dealing with. You have to weigh the cost of, okay, which one is better for me as an individual? Right? That's the decision you got to make because Paul is laying both of them out for you. Right? Let's keep going. Grab, our, uh, grab Ephesians for me. Ephesians chapter 22. Let's talk a little bit about the roles of a husband and a wife. Ephesians what? This is Ephesians chapter twenty, uh, chapter five, verse twenty-two. Wives, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as the Messiah is the head of the congregation, and he is the savior of the body. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as the congregation is subject to the Messiah, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Mm -hmm. Husbands, love your wives, even as the Messiah also loved the congregation and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious congregation, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that, should it, that, that it should be holy and without blemish. Right. So making this practical when it says be subject to your husband. Right. What does that mean? It means exactly what it sounds like it means. Right. The husband should be able to make the final call. Even if that final call. Right. Is well, you make the decision. Right. Don't don't make this stuff too deep. It's, it's saying exactly what it means. Right. You have to just be subject to the husband. So if your husband in particular says, I do not want to deal with none of these bills and I don't want to deal with these kids, I work all day long. You make all the decisions of the house. Guess what? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as when your husband got a disagreement with something and how it's being run, it don't turn into I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I don't care what he say. That's out of order. Right. That's out of order. But this idea, sometimes we get the idea that the man is the one that got to work and the woman is the one that got to take care of the kids and stay at home and all that. That's not that's not that's not our law. That's not that's not something that's mandated. If that's how you set up the household, that's fine. If the man say that's how I want my household to run. Right. Then he got to find a wife that's going to be agreeable to that. Because Otherwise, he's going to have a, a long life. You know, what I'm that's going to be a long life. Right. But you find a wife that's agreeable to that. If, if she agreeable to that, then y'all run it the way y'all run it. Right. If you got if you got a man that like, listen, you know, what I'm saying, I'm crippled in my hands. I can't do work. I get you know, what I'm saying I get I get uh, Social Security because, you know, what I'm saying uh, whatever, whatever. I can't even work. And the woman do all the work. She go out. She work. This, that, another. That's fine. She make all the decisions in the house. So, look, this is what we got to do. This is the next thing I do all the planning. This is the house we should buy. That's fine. All the husband got to do is be like, I want her to make those, those decisions. That's cool. That's he. She is still being subject to him, even if it looked like she has a, a less stereotypical typical role. The only problem is when there becomes a disagreement about decisions, she has to be subject to the husband. That's it. If the husband say sign off on like, listen, you make all the decisions, you do everything you want to do. That's fine. Think about it like a business in the corporate world or something. Right. I might run a whole department, 
right? And then I have a manager that's underneath me, and she has a team that's underneath her, right? That manager, I might tell her, make whatever decision that you want to make. I trust you. Do it. Make whatever decisions you want to make. Run the team however you want to run the team. If anybody comes and says to you, tell them I give you my approval. She's making all the decisions. I might even say, you know what? Hey, this is what my boss told me. What do you think I should do? And she might even tell me, this is what you should do. She might be making my decisions, right? That is no, it is nothing wrong. It happens every day in business. Every single day that you got a superior that has somebody underneath them that they rely on them to make the decisions. Right? But if there's ever a disagreement, that superior will say, oh, hold on, not this time. This time I need you to do it this way. Right? This time I need you to do it that way. And that's how it has to play out when it comes to the husband and wife fault. Let whatever, don't put the pressure on yourself for these stereotypical roles or the non-stereotypical roles. However it work out for y'all, y'all figure that out. And the male makes the final decision, right? Keep going. So, um, Sister Pamela was saying she see women bossing their husbands around, and is that right? And Sharon was like, if he likes it that way, right? So it's up to the two on how they like to communicate and run their house, right? As long as one feels like they're not being disrespected or, you know, whatever rules they set up for each other, then... It's it's however however they want to however they want to run it really. Um, yeah, it depends on who's saying bossing around. Yeah, it's like it's like yeah, it's a, all that stuff is subjective, right? So it's like if we on the outside looking in and we see that the woman is making decisions, right, and she's telling the husband, "Hey, this is what you should do here," and he's agreeable to it. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's their business. Stay out of their business, right? That's their business, and that's how I should run, and that's how I go. However. If the husband is not agree, the only issue is when the husband's not agreeable. So no matter what the situation is, no matter who making the decision, no matter what's happening, if the husband at any point is saying, I don't think that my house should run this way. I don't think my marriage should run this way. Right. Then the woman should be subject to that. But if he's OK with it, however it's running, if he's OK with it and that's how you want it to be, then I ain't got nothing to do. It's only the argument. Only the arguments, only when there's a fight. And that's not to, and that's not to say that a couple shouldn't argue and fight. It's not to say that that's wrong to argue and fight. It just mean that through that discussion that y'all having, through that fight that y'all having, at the end of the day, when it's all resolved, the husband needs to be agreeable to what's happening. Right? Because he's the one that's going to be held accountable. Everything is the husband's fault. Everything is the husband's fault. As a wife, I let me look. As a wife, don't feel bad about blaming your husband for everything because it's his fault. <laughs> That's how that thing works. Everything is the husband's fault. That's what we walking into. Think about that before you get married. That's how it works. You are if you the head, you being the head don't mean that. Oh, I, I get to make the final call and it's supposed to run the way I want, but I don't got to deal with no challenges. Everything just work out my way. No, that's not what being the head is about. When y'all sure is the head, do it work out like that for him? Yeah. No, we sin. We do, and he got to pay for it. He died for it. That's what it mean to be a husband. The thing ain't fair. You think it was fair? They had they nailed that man to a darn tree. The thing ain't got nothing to do with being fair. The thing got to do with what's right. Who cares about what's fair? Y'all, y'all gonna give us what's fair in the end. Right now, we go at what's right, no matter what it feel like, no matter what it look like. If the man is agreeable to it, make that decision and let it run however. Stay out of these people's business. Everybody all in everybody else's bed and do it. Stay out of these people's business. However they run their house is fine. The only time you should even think about getting involved is if you see a man say, I don't like how this is happening. And a woman is saying, you know what? I'm well within my rights as a godly woman to do whatever I want because I think it's right. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. Right? To make sure the man is sub I mean make sure the, the woman is subject to the man that's it and however that looks in their household is their business and as a man who has that that authority right it comes it comes with the idea that no matter what happens it's your fault 
It's your job to get your household in order, no matter what type of wife you chose, no matter what situation you find yourself in, whatever, no matter what mistake you made, she made, the kids made, whoever, you have to figure out your way to get your household in order, period. That is it. That is your job, no matter how it go. And if that means that, man, look, when we got together, you know what I'm saying? She made all the decisions. And then you see that she steered y'all down some path that just messed up. That thing don't make no darn sense. Y'all darn in debt. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Living out on the street based off of her decision. Okay. But you knew that's what type of woman she was when you met her. She wanted to make the decision. You did that. Now you got to switch it up. Now you got to convince her that you should be making the decisions. And she's been a strong woman her whole life. That's tough for her. Right? But now you got to try to mold and be patient with your woman and string her along and do what you got to do to keep her buy-in so that you don't lose your wife. Right? And you got to get the kids comfortable. Well, okay, mama ain't making all the decisions now. Maybe mama was a, the, she was the disciplinarian. And dad, you know what I'm saying, he chill, man. All he did is work. Right? All he did was sit in his room and play the game. I don't care. I don't, whatever. I ain't going to use the stereotype. So he sat in a, he lazy. He sat in the room and he played a game. But he still ran the house. He said, I don't know, I'm okay with you making that decision. She ran him into the thing. Guess what? At some point now, it's like, okay, I'm out to, I'm out to work because I can't get her respect unless I'm working. So now I'm out to work. Now I got to make sure I find something that make more money than her. Or I got to convince her and say, hey, may, who makes money? Work? Ain't, ain't, that ain't it. I got to appeal to her senses to make sure that she understands this is how the house should, whatever it takes, you have to do it. And you have to do it while maintaining righteousness. And while leading her to righteousness and leading your family to righteousness. Right. There is no excuse for the husband. Period. Right. Whatever it is. That's what you got. Figure it out. Make it happen. That thing look pretty when you look ahead. Right. That thing look pretty when you look ahead. When you look at all. Oh, yeah. The husband's ahead. It look. Pre oh, listen. Men can abuse that thing all they want. One thing you never hear them talk about is the accountability part of it. You don't hear that talked about. Yeah, man is the head. What that mean? That mean it's all his fault. Look, at my job, I, I, I run my department, right? I'm, a head of the, I'm the head of the department. That's what they call me, right? head of the department, right? So I had the, I had the well, head of my teams in the department, right? So in my department, where the team is, with my teams, if there's any problem, guess who they talking to? Me. If my, look, if I got somebody on my team and my manager made the wrong decision, right? The manager underneath me, she, she made the wrong decision or he made the wrong decision, right? Or one of, the, one of the people on their teams make the wrong decision and it gets caught in the audit. Guess who they call it? Me. And they're going to say, hey, so what happened here? And so what I have to do is I had to go and look and I, I told them not to do that. I told them not to say that. I told them not to work that case that way. I told them that the, I wrote a whole, I made sure a whole procedure was in place for them to follow and they didn't follow. You know what? Guess who's accountable for that though? Me. Now it's my job to hold them accountable. But you think my boss is worried about them being accountable? My, do, my boss is worried about how am I running the team to make sure that this don't happen again. And that's how it is. It's responsibility with being the head. It's all your fault, no matter what. Even if it ain't, it's your fault. Because you should have made a better decision to prevent it from happening, right? You got to have that mindset as a male, right? If you're going to be a man and you're going to be, and you want to, and you want to walk in, oh, I'm the head of the household. That's cool because you are. That's book. But now also walk in, I got to die for mine. In other words, not die for mine and like, oh, somebody's trying to kill my family. I have to step in front of the bullet. That's easy. That's easy. That's a no brainer. That's not the hard one. The hard one is my wife won't listen to me. My kids won't listen to me. That's my fault. That's the hard one. My, my wife, she got this. She been watching social media and watching all these rappers and all this stuff. And she just got this warped perspective on life. That's my fault. Right? When you can do that, that's how you understand being ahead. Don't even put yourself on that category talking about you want to be the head if you can't do that. If you don't think you can walk into your marriage and do that, don't even put yourself in that category. Sit your butt down, listen to Paul. Be single. You ain't ready for it. It's too much for you. Trust me. Trust me. That woman going to wear your butt out. Going to stress your butt out. You ain't going to be able to focus on You going to mess around and leave God. You going to be like Chingy and worshiping the Chingy and Ken Kendrick. Worshiping stars and stuff. Worshiping trees. Right? 
because that's what happens. These women are drive you darn crazy if you don't understand your responsibility. Can't nobody draw you crazy when you understand it. You got to understand it. That thing don't work. What are we talking about in the chat? We got questions. Even if the leader of the congregation, what was that? Let me see. I don't know. I don't know if I understand, but if you got questions, go ahead and put it out there so I can try to catch them as we teach it. Right. But that's what it means to be the head. Keep going. I think we still in Ephesians five. Right. For the husband is the head of the wife. Wait, my bad. Oh. That he might present himself a glorious congregation, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men mm -hmm. to love their wives of their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the congregation. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. All this right, they too mystery. shall be one flesh, right? So we're going to stop right now and we're going to do a part two of this. And we're going to do the part two on um, uh, uh, the, you know what I'm saying, the day of, uh, the first day of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, the week of Tabernacles. Um, and then kind of dive into the other pieces of this, right? So we've talked a little bit about the responsibilities of a man. We're going to talk a little bit about the responsibilities of a woman. Right. We're going to look at some examples of women that do not fit the stereotypical. So I, I want to defend against this idea that the Bible tells you that a woman got to stay at home and got to did. No, the Bible tells you a woman got to be subject to a man. That's true. Right. But that is not the limitation that the book tell you. Right. The book gives you plenty of examples of women being the total opposite of what people imagine in their mind. Right. And so I'm we're going to go through some of those examples. And then we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about men having multiple wives and what the book has to say about it, whether it is righteous, not righteous. What's the better thing to do? Go into all the details and kind of dive into it. We'll do that on part two. We'll deal with divorce. We'll do what the what 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 how the law handles divorce, how the law handles adultery, how the law handles fornication, the differences of the two um, a whole lot. You know what I'm saying? A whole lot. We're going to still a lot that we got to cover. So we'll do that in part two. Are there any questions in the meantime? <laughs> so Sharon said, was I making a meal to break our fast? Uh, no, not this time. Not this time. Maybe next time. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it'll even be Thursday. Maybe it'll be, uh, maybe it'll be, uh, maybe it'll be Friday in the daytime. But I don't know. Let me talk to Brother T. We'll talk. I'll talk to Brother T when we get off here. Um, and then we'll we'll try to figure that out. But Sister Sharon, it's food for show on, uh, you know what I'm saying, on the first day of Tabernacles. So I'm going I'm to send y'all something. It's probably going to be Friday. Um, I'll send y'all something or, or, or Thursday night, maybe. But I'll send y'all something and let y'all know once I uh, once I get it all together. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, we should be praying all through our fast. Right. So Sister Sharon asked you, do we need to pray out of the fast? So uh, we should be praying all through the fast. Um, um, and certainly at the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. Give thanks to the most high God. Uh, and if you if you want to pray together or be together when we pray, um, just let me know. We can. You know, what I'm saying I know you right down the street, so we can we can figure that out. But no, we don't necessarily have to be together as we pray out the fast or to end the fast. Um, but definitely should be praying all through the fast. Just use this time to connect with the Most High God, um, get a deeper understanding, a deeper connection, uh, and, and try to dig into the Word and let Him move you how He's going to move you. It's been good for me, y'all. I feel like it's just getting started. I feel like too much time passed through, honestly. But uh, it's been good to me, honestly. It's been good. I appreciate y'all. All right. All right, we'll see y'all next time, man. Thank you. All right, bro.